Hey everybody, grab your deli del delicious beverage. This is what I sound like on three hours of sleep. I'm back from Hawaii, back to the mainland, back to work, and ready to solve the world's biggest problems. Um, let me, let me uh, give you a little, little bit of history context, context here. I can barely talk this morning. I'm pretty tired. <laughs> but I didn't want to miss out on coffee with all of you. Speaking of coffee, if you have your coffee, now would be the time to lift your mug for a simultaneous sip. Mm. Oh, that is good simultaneously sipped coffee. Um, so here's a mystery that I've been working on forever. One of the things you hear reported all the time is that Russia is trying to destabilize the United States. It's trying to do little election things and maybe other things to destabilize the United States. But nobody ever says why. Do they really think that if we get the second best president you know, you know, whatever, whoever was second choice. Do they think that's really going to help them in some way? I don't really understand the connection of why in 2018 they would have a reason to to try to destabilize us. Because realistically, I'm, I don't think that they could um, destabilize us to the point where the, you know, the republic fails or we're less of a rival. And I don't, I can't imagine them thinking that. Well, just to mess with us is not really a reason. Now, it could be that they do it purely for um, pushback reasons. In other words, there may be plenty of things we're doing to them, and they're just saying, hey, we know you're doing these things to us, we're going to do these things back. Now, if that's the case, that's not really the way it's being reported, right? It's always being reported as, Russia, for no reason whatsoever, wants to irrationally destabilize the United States. Now, I'm not saying that they're not trying to do that. I'm saying there's something left out. The story doesn't make sense. Because in what world could that be to their advantage? Now, think about that <clears throat> as sort of a backdrop for the next point about North Korea. <clears throat> About two years ago, when President Trump was candidate Trump, we started talking more and more about North Korea because that was um, you know, part of the campaign rhetoric. And do you remember two years ago, it was common wisdom that Kim Jong-un was an irrational, crazy person who could not be negotiated with and that whatever he was going to do could not be predicted because it was all irrational. And you may remember that to the best of my knowledge, there were very few voices in the world saying, no, he's completely rational. And I, I was one of them because I saw no evidence that anything he did was irrational. It was evil, but you know, you give people unlimited power. You make anybody a dictator and you're going to get, you're going to get some evil. That's just because people are like that. But that, that's very different from being irrational. And so now it seems that the, uh, the public opinion has completely changed from they're all that he's irrational to, oh, he's totally rational. In two years, we've, we've suddenly decided he's gone from irrational to rational. And, now, and that's actually the common opinion now. Now, I, I, of course, agree with that. And that's important to this next point. Uh, I saw an article yesterday. Somebody tweeted to me. I wish I could remember where it was or who said it, but some expert on North Korea, uh, to, the, to the extent that you can even be an expert on North Korea, said that the reason North Korea uh, is developing nukes is, and this is, this is sort of um, counterintuitive, that they're, in, they're creating nukes to improve their relationship with the United States in particular, but other countries as well. And the idea is that that's what China did. China developed nuclear weapons to take 
um, any kind of military action between China and the United States largely off the table, which also allowed us to talk. It allowed Nixon to go to China. Uh, it allowed um, you know good relations to develop, and that the idea was that China d China intended that they intended to develop nuclear weapons not to attack the United States, but to become a peer so that we could have eventual improved relations. And so the thought was that Kim Jong-un is following the same playbook, that developing nuclear weapons is, has absolutely no offensive um, intention, but has a very good defensive intention, and that once they're you know, regarded as a peer, then they can negotiate as a peer, at least a nuclear peer, somewhat, you know, relative terms. And, and so the, the notion is that what North Korea wants is to not get in the war. And they also know that they don't have any realistic chance of militarily taking over the South. So that Kim Jong-un's danger is psychological in the sense that he is afraid of our attack and he needs a defense. Now, would it be rational to fear an attack from the United States? Well, if you looked at Saddam Hussein, you'd have to say he, once he was our friend, and then he wasn't. And if you look at Libya, they got rid of their nukes, and it didn't take long before Gaddafi was gone. So if North Korea is rational, they're looking at the situation and saying, we need some nukes. So I want to suggest a uh, out-of-the-box workaround to solve a psychological problem. All right, so the problem with North Korea is not a military problem. It's a psychological problem which has uh, turned into a military risk. And what I mean by that is we don't want to attack them. They don't want us to attack them. We both want exactly the same thing, but we're not so sure that the other one is, is being honest about their intentions. Now, we have good reason not to trust North Korea because they've lied to us on a number of occasions about their nuclear ambitions. But it was also completely rational to lie to us about their nuclear ambitions because they have a legitimate reason to think that the United States sometimes attacks people that we say we're not going to attack. You know, people who used to be our allies, Iraq and Libya being the two more recent examples. So how do you how do you break that psychological logjam? And I wanted to give you just just float an idea. Suppose you did a, a public opinion poll in the United States. So it's United States of voters. Let's say limit it to voters. Um, and you say, would you ever support a, a uh, politician, whether it's your congressperson, senator, you know, uh, representative, or president, the, the question has to be worded more elegantly, but would you ever support a political leader who attacked North Korea without direct military justification? Now, we would all, we would all support a leader who, who counterattacked. So if North Korea you know, launched an attack, of course the United States would be 80%, 90% on board with a counterattack. But suppose Kim Jong-un saw a poll of how, how many citizens of the United States would be willing to support their own government under a condition of an unprovoked attack. Now in this case, unprovoked means that there's no military provocation you know, we, we just decided we wanted to conquer them or take over the North. How many would support it? I think that opinion poll would be close to zero. I think you would find something like zero public support for an unprovoked attack to conquer North Korea, or even to take out their leadership if it's, if it's a big risk militarily that they would respond. Now, that along with the second part of my idea, which is uh, I think the UN could offer to North Korea what I call the Switzerland of the East option, which is rather than just get rid of your nukes, they go all the way to full Switzerland neutrality with, and here's the key part, 
with the security guarantee of all the all the powers in the area, you know, China, Russia, us, South Korea, and as well as in, as well as the United Nations. You know, you could probably get something like a, a hundred percent security, um, you know, council support for making North Korea uh, a Switzerland unattackable. We will never attack you. Do whatever you want, kind of a country. If they get rid of their nukes, you know, it all depends on that. They'd have to get rid of those. So here's the question: If if it's true that North Korea really wants nuclear weapons primarily for defense and to become a, you know, a negotiating peer so that they can, you know, be safe. The trouble is that that's not safe enough for us because if they have nukes, they might be, you know, they might be tempted to sell some of that technology to somebody who's a bad actor. Um, and so would a, would a public opinion poll of people who are voters in the United States who say there is zero support now or ever for a war to conquer North Korea, how would that affect the psychology of Kim Jong-un? Well, I think he would know that our system depends on the support of the people. You can't even do a war in the United States without support of the people. And a war against North Korea is not a trivial war. You, know, you, you can imagine a scenario where there's some little island country that the president unilaterally says, well, we're going to move in and, and do something, and then later gets permission from the Congress and the people. You can imagine that, but you can't imagine a war with North Korea that doesn't have the backing of the American people, and there wouldn't be. Um, my guess is it would be close to zero support for a public opinion. Now, that alone doesn't solve anything, but it would go a long way toward um, taking the temperature down. All right. Yes, we have a long history of doing it, but I think you could inoculate against a war by getting the citizens to say in advance that they wouldn't support it. There, there's... Um, there's some good science behind this, which is if you get people to commit to a position, once they've committed to it, it's really hard for them to change. So if you, if you do an opinion poll in which you get Americans to you know, deal with the question of whether they'd like to see an offensive war about, against North Korea, you know they wouldn't. And once they've committed to it, either by answering a poll or by talking about it and telling their friends they're against it, they probably aren't going to change their mind. And it, it really takes it off the table for leaders in a, in a republic slash democratic system. <laughs> Bad polls stopped Obama from enforcing his Syria red line. Uh, I don't know if that's a good example, but it might be. <clears throat> Would they believe it? Well, that's a good question. I suppose you would need, you know, multiple polls. You know, if Gallup and a few other respected pollsters did polls and they found something like, I, I think the answer would be close to zero, wouldn't it? Is there, let me ask you, is there anyone here who would support an offensive war against North Korea if they got rid of their nukes? Like, is there anything that would allow, that would, that you could imagine would make you want to do that. So, so who would be in favor? <laughs> Is anybody in favor of attacking North Korea for any reason if they give up their nukes? Somebody said yes. Well, somebody said, I don't know my base. <laughs> uh, yes, torturing children. So somebody... Somebody said they'd support an offensive war to, what, save their own population? I'm here to tell you that if you want the North Korean people to be okay, you want a deal where there's no nukes, no war, and their economy can recover. That's, that's how their people... You know, there, there's no situation where attacking North Korea helps their citizens. 
That's not a path to anything. Yeah, obviously, counterattack everybody agrees with. So there's nobody here who would disagree, I don't think. Well, I'll say the majority of people would agree that a defensive war is justified. Yeah. So you saw from the answers here that, and I don't think the people who said yes were really being serious. You know, they haven't really thought it through. I, I think you would find 95% um, agreement that there's just no reason that we would ever support our politicians going to war with North Korea. So think about it. The, the public could directly cause peace with North Korea because the leaders ultimately are going to bow to the, uh, the, the... They wouldn't bow to a small majority, maybe. You know, if 51% of the public says, no, we don't want to attack North Korea, well, that would still allow a commander-in-chief to do something if he thought he had a reason. You know, it would be close enough. But if it's 95% say, no frickin' way, there's nothing you can ever tell me that will make me want to go to war with North Korea, with or without nukes, um, then I think you have something you could take to them. <laughs> uh, how do you take the example of Ukraine? How do you take the example off the table? I don't know exactly what that question means, okay? What if North Korea sells its nukes? Yeah, so that's why you, there's no situation we can be happy while they have nukes. So in order for them to be Switzerland to the east, they would have to give up their nukes. Still pissed about Otto Wampir. You should be, but also keep in mind that we really don't know what happened. Um, it is very likely that, that, you know, it's very likely that whatever happened to him happened locally meaning that he was imprisoned at a jail that's brutal to everybody and he got brutalized and maybe they hate Americans, you know. But it seems unlikely that the leader ordered him to be, you know, beaten into a coma. It's possible. But it seems unlikely that came from the top, but not impossible. Um, how can a thousand people represent 33 million? Don't know what you mean. Oh, Ukraine gave up its Soviet nukes in 94. Okay, so Ukraine's another example of someone who gave up nukes and it didn't work out for them. Well, that's why you need the Switzerland option on top of giving up your nukes. And it seems to me that um, North Korea is mostly worried about one country, the United States. I, I don't think they're worried about Russia. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they're worried about attack by Russia. Maybe they are. Um, Japan, nah. Well, remember that what Kim wants is a dynasty that will last. You know, above everything else he wants is that he doesn't want nuclear weapons. He wants a tool that will allow him to have a lasting, a lasting defensive situation. And the Switzerland option, if the UN backs it and they get security guarantees, could give them that. They're more worried about starving and freezing to death. Well, at the moment they might be. Because I'm pretty sure those uh, economic sanctions are working. Good thing you're not a foreign policy advisor, Scott. <laughs> well, um, for, for anybody who's new to these periscopes, I here's how I justify talking about topics that I don't know anything about, which has never stopped me before. The, the specific way I talk about topics is through a window of persuasion. So I know a little bit about that. So that's the, that's the angle I'm coming at, both politics and international affairs. 
<clears throat> and my um, my larger <clears throat> my my larger um, philosophy for all this is that good ideas tend to take on a life of their own and and they propagate and they eat the bad ideas over time. So I'm not too worried about suggesting ideas that people who know more than I do can say, ah, it's a bad idea, reject it. Because bad ideas tend to tend to die. They, they don't evolve. But a good idea could be just something that somebody hasn't thought of before or they haven't thought of it in that way. So I, I favor the diversification of ideas because it allows the good ones to rise. That doesn't mean my ideas are good, but I'm adding to the I'm adding to the, um, let's say, the pool of ideas. And if you haven't heard this particular idea, then something was added. That doesn't mean it's going to rise to the top, nor do I think it necessarily should. But it does mean it's it's added to the, uh, it's added to the, uh, uh, added to the pile. What about North Korean imperialism? Well, I don't see too many signs of that. Flight home was great. Thanks for asking. Um, and now I'm going to close out today. Oh, somebody wants to talk about the FISA memo, but after a simultaneous sip. Simultaneous sip. Coming up. Hmm. I think you've noticed, um, oh, thank you for joining Patreon. Uh, if you don't know, I, um, I signed up for a page on Patreon. And assuming that there are uh, sufficiently large, um, generous people, uh, I'll, I'll look at uh, funding, turning my, my periscopes into podcasts and YouTubes. Uh, etc. Mostly podcasts, I think, is what people want. So they can play it on their phone without using the battery. Um, so, FISA. So, the whole FISA situation and the Nunes memo, etc., has, it seems to me, created a lot of speculation that doesn't seem to be grounded in anything that looks like credible information. So it seems like some of that conversation is down to um, did some external contractor like Fusion GPS or Crowdsource or something have access to raw uh, raw collections of ordinary citizens or, or just citizens uh, conversations. Now, if such a thing happened, it would be bad and people should be fired and maybe somebody goes to jail. But uh, I haven't seen anything that looks like evidence that that happened. It all seems like speculation at this point. So my caution is that no matter how excited you are about this whole Nunes memo and um, FISA and all that, there's a very good chance that some procedures and maybe some, some laws were violated. But I don't know that it's going to be the big deal that everybody thinks. It might be a big deal in terms of being a big story because people's, um, you know, people's uh, privacy was violated for, for the wrong reasons. But, but I don't, yeah, I don't know if it's going to go so far as to look like treason. Because all, remember, all the the only thing the FBI needs to be free from any kind of accusations of treason or political. Partisanship. Why didn't somebody tell me my uh, my microphone wasn't on the entire time? So I think all the FBI would need in order to demonstrate that they had not done something treasonous, um, well, I guess treasonous, is that they had a good reason for what whatever they were doing. And yeah, now it's very loud, isn't it? <laughs> um, and it seems to me that the FBI would not be much challenged to show that there's a reason that's not just a political reason and is not treasonous. It doesn't seem like that's a hard bar to 
you know, I'm no lawyer, but it just doesn't seem like the bar is high. So here's what it would look like. We heard some, we got some information that we didn't think was credible. We didn't have a chance to, you know, search it ourselves. We've been working with these guys. We walled off some data for them to look at, but, you know, we had some controls on it. You know, they, maybe, maybe one of somebody from our team was working with them, so they didn't really see more than they should. You know, those, those are the bad examples. But it's so easy to imagine that once you hear the whole story, the FBI will have a reason for why it did what it did. And the reason might be searching for what looked like could have been a legitimate crime. That's all they have to do. And if I had to guess, yeah, there may be some people in trouble for violating some internal rules. And there may have even been some shortcuts taken that violated some pretty important laws. And maybe there might be some people who have to answer to that. But probably that's different from saying that the whole thing was a conspiracy. So I wouldn't get too excited about this being the smoking gun that shows the deep state has been trying to destroy the world. Which, by the way, may have been the case. All right? I'm not going to rule out that there is such a thing as a deep state and they were trying to influence the election in a way that nobody should be happy about. But that's, uh, that's different from saying that treason happened. Um, yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, but did it seem to you that I think there were two events that happened about the same time. One is the fake news award, and the other is the one-year anniversary of the Trump administration. So those, those two things working together, plus the president's body of accomplishment after one year, that's, it's getting hard to ignore. You know, even the haters have to first acknowledge that he did a bunch of things he said he was going to do, and then they add their hate on top of it. Um, so it seems to me that the, the tone of the reporting about the president has changed kind of quickly. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm, I'm seeing. I'm seeing the, the media that used to be pretty aggressively anti-Trump, they seem to be going out of their way to show another point of view lately. You know, New York Times, CNN, the, 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 the move toward some kind of balance seems obvious to me, but it could also be I'm just being... Um, influenced by some anecdotal things, and, and it's not a big change. At the moment, it looks like a change in tone. Um, yeah, other, others say you, you're noticing a slight change in tone. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Don Lemon is still on the warpath, I'm sure. You know... The, the most amazing thing that I see, and I, I swear I'm the only person that I hear talking about this, the, the biggest lie in the media has to be this whole Charlottesville thing. Um, the idea that the president draws a moral equivalence between uh, protesters and white supremacists, all you'd have to do is ask him, and he would tell you he doesn't. So... Taking something that is inelegantly worded, or when he said there were some, the other part of that that's the same story, is he said there were some fine people at the Charlottesville um, protests. Now, obviously, he wasn't talking about the white supremacists who were marching and saying anti, uh, anti-Jewish slogans while they were marching, when he has you know Jewish family members, Israel loves them. Um, you know, his, his daughter is converted Jew, his grandchildren are Jewish, his closest advisors, many of them are, are Jewish. You know, everything about this is completely crazy, right? There is no possibility that he was well-informed about who was there and who was saying what, and then decided to back the people who were against his own family. If you go on television 
And you say, yeah, he went on television and and he was backing the people who would like to you know, kill his family. I don't know how you can say that on TV when it is so much more obvious, or let's say likely. Let, let me say that none of us can read his mind, right? So there are, two, there are two possibilities. One is that he actually went on television and intentionally said that he was in favor of white supremacists saying anti, anti-Jewish anti stuff in front of the world. Like as president, that he would say, yeah, yeah, there were some fine, those people were fine. There's no way that happened. <laughs> All right? You did see something that looked like that. You definitely saw something that looked like that. But compare the possibilities. One possibility, he's, he wasn't well informed about who was there. And he just thought some people were there, you know, in favor of keeping historical statues, which is a little bit different than being a hardcore racist. All right. I happen to think that it's offensive to keep statues, but being offensive is a little bit different than being, you know, marching in, with uh, tiki torches and shouting uh, racist slogans. Yeah, and he was very clear about denouncing them. So anybody who thinks that he just changed his mind from one day to the next, I mean, how? I don't know how hypnotized you'd have to be to think that he went on television and, and thought to himself, huh, I, I guess I'll just take sides with white supremacists on television. That should go over well. That didn't happen. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way that happened. And if he had, does anybody think he would have changed his mind the next day because people complained? Uh, none of that makes sense. The only thing that makes sense is that he wasn't informed about the composition of the of the protests that day. Probably thought there were some fine people there. <laughs> and, and guess what? I thought that. When I heard, first heard the story, I just assumed that there were lots of other protesters there you know, for, for their own reasons, and they weren't all racist. I was... You know, close to wrong. There were some people who were there just for free speech reasons who were not racist, but not many of them. Um, is there anybody here who thinks that when President... I just want to test this, because we, you, most of you are Trump supporters, probably. But if there, there are always, with this many people, there should be a few dozen others. Is there anybody here who really thinks the President of the United States went on television and intentionally said something that he believed was supportive of the high quality of, of racists? Is there anybody who believes that that actually happened? Because the news on both Fox and CNN, when a, when a pundit gets on and says that that did happen, they're never challenged. There's somebody who thinks that happened. All right, but look at all the no's. It didn't happen. So uh, to me, that was the biggest fake news of the year. And I suspect that they considered putting, you know, I'm sure they, the president considered that on his list of fake news. But the trouble is, if you deny it, it just brings it up again. And So sometimes, sometimes it just doesn't pay to deny things because it just brings up the issue again. Yeah, look at this. Why, why is it that no, uh, that no host, there's somebody who actually believes it happened. <laughs> that, that's mind-boggling that somebody thinks he actually did that intentionally. Um, and and let, me, let me just throw out the other one, the, the birther issue. Now, I believe the pre President Obama was born in this country, but I'll even take it further. I didn't care one way or the other, because he was certainly an American, you know, at least, you know, even if there had been a paperwork problem, I didn't care. But um, does anybody imagine that if Hillary Clinton had any kind of a birth certificate irregularity or even question or even rumor, does anyone believe 
that Donald Trump would have ignored a, a birth certificate question slash you know potential irregularity if it had been a white woman or a white man? Does anybody believe that he would have left a weapon unused? It's crazy. So to say that that's obviously racism because President Obama also happens to be uh, black, you know, I just can't imagine any world in which uh, President Trump, who uses every tool available to him, would not have used that tool. It's the most common political tool anybody's ever used through history. You're not really a member of this district. You know, you weren't born here. It's the most common common tool, yeah, used with Ted Cruz. I, I, it's just mind-boggling that either of those things are used as the two best examples of how people think President Trump is definitely a racist, when those are the most clearly, demonstrably, logically could not be what the what the way they are being reported. It just couldn't be. Uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah, you know the Hillary started the birther thing. Um, I, I always think the the other side did it too. The argument is the is the weakest. What do I think about the shutdown? Well, of course, the whole idea of the shutdown is that both parties are, are feeling out the situation to see who's going to get blamed the most. At the moment, it looks like the Democrats are getting blamed the most. So that means that President Trump will ride it as long as he needs to to get what he needs. Um, you know, I'm a little surprised that... Schumer doesn't offer an end to at least chain migration. Because, I don't know, are there that many people who think somebody's cousin should come into the country because they came in? Yeah, I don't know that there's so many people who are... Um, <laughs> I don't know if there are so many people who really want chain migration the way it exists right now. I just don't know. I can't imagine there's that much support for it. Scott, do you believe Trumpsters still believe? Um, uh, yes, I believe that there are some people who think that Obama is not a citizen. But there are also some people who believe that they've been abducted by aliens. There are some people who believe that the president... Uh, said racist things in public, and and it was the way it was reported. <laughs> Schumer wants amnesty for Dreamer parents. Um, will the shutdown affect the stock market? Yeah, maybe a little bump. Typically, these shutdowns are, are sort of a multi-day thing. They're not going to be multi-week thing. This one might be different. This one could go longer than any shutdown we've seen. But every day it goes. I think the president tweeted that the Democrats were looking weak. <laughs> uh, and I thought that was funny. All right. How many Trumpsters believe that Obama is not a citizen? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think um, I think it's going to be expensive to shut down the government, and it's going to be painful for some people. Um. All right, I think we've said enough, and we're going to close off for now, and I will talk to you 